four, three, two, one, action. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, debriefing session uh, of the training workshop for the Norwest Shelf uh, Seas. I'm here uh, today with uh, uh, Vincent Le Gros uh, as a, a technical assistant from Market Ocean, uh, Robert uh, McEwen and Marina Tonani from the UK Met Office. Uh, they will uh, help us to, to uh, moderate this, uh, this session. Um, we hope you had the time to practice and run uh, the end zone exercises and the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, all around this session, uh, uh, you, will add the, the, you will have the opportunity to ask questions live uh, to the experts of the different uh, uh, se sessions. Sorry. Um, uh, the experts uh, prepared uh, some question and answer uh, collected on the chat or uh, during the first uh, session to introduce uh, their, their part. Um, and then uh, you can ask your question on the chat mm -hmm. on the bottom right of your screen uh, directly on the, on the chat with the, the question mark uh, to identify your, your, your comment as a question. And uh, just some information. <clears throat> your access to the Jupyter Hub will run until uh, uh, March uh, next uh, year. So you have time to, to continue uh, practicing on this, uh, uh, on this uh, platform. Uh, after the workshop, you will receive a document with uh, all the uh, question and answer collected during the first round and the, this, uh, this session and with all the links to continue to uh, uh, to access uh, the uh, training material uh, the tutorial videos uh, etc um, next uh, training uh, workshop session will be uh, a session dedicated to the arctic uh, region and the workshop is scheduled uh, for the uh, 3rd of december uh, so don't hesitate today to ask questions. This is uh, your last chance uh, to, to exchange live with uh, the experts, so don't hesitate. Uh, but uh, to, to launch uh, this session, uh, we want to propose you a short uh, survey as an icebreaker. So take time to answer this survey. You, you will have uh, two or three minutes to do that, and we can check uh, the answer uh, just after the, uh, your, your participation. So first question, uh, which Copernicus marine products are you interested in? Uh, so you have ocean color observation products, uh, physical model products, in situ, in situ observation products, wave model products, or bio model products. Okay, this is the, the uh, you have this is a multi choice uh, multiple choice uh, question so you can answer uh, several uh, answers second question did you test or run one or more practical exercises uh, during these uh, two weeks uh, of practical homework of course and more than one yes at least one well i dropped because it's too difficult for me no, because of time, but I surely will. Uh, no, because it's not the kind of exercises that I'm looking for. Okay. After your participation to this workshop, do you feel more confident to use the Copernicus Marine Service products? Because this, this is the main goal of this kind of workshop. So we hope yes, but tell us. And last question. Do you think the skippers Alex Thompson and Samantha Davis are using Copernicus Marine physical and wave products to optimize their routes and win the Vendée Globe? Yes, for sure. No, is Eunice Fool. I don't know what you are talking about. So this is the, the real icebreaker question. Okay. And this is a, a, a specific race, the Vendée Globe, because the sailors uh, have to make their own 
uh, routing. Normally, they have uh, uh, a team uh, on land, uh, a team who are dedicated to, to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of forecast and, and routing uh, uh, prediction. But during the Vendée Globe, they are alone on uh, their uh, their boat, and they have to do by uh, self. So it's very complicated. I think uh, for sure some of uh, the Copernicus products would be useful to them. But uh, right now, I guess most of them have left the Northwest Shelf. So perhaps some of the products from the Ibi region or the global products. Uh, I see most of the field are, are past the. Cape Verde Islands, so uh, uh, making good progress. I think where, when where there is no wind, it's very interesting to have some, <laughs> to know some currents, to to know if uh, you you take the currents in the good way or not, <laughs> to mm. uh, to gain uh, some uh, nautical height, uh, or, or the wave products to to uh, to have an idea of the 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 state of the the sea uh, you will uh, uh, you you will uh, you will have uh, in the in the next days but it's a uh, very difficult race very very difficult so let's see the the results vincent can you publish the so okay okay so the majority of the products <laughs> are useful to uh, our participants. So great, it's fine. So second question, do you test run one or more practical exercises during these two weeks practical work? Okay, of course, and more than one. Okay, 11%. Yes, at least one, uh, 19%. Well, I dropped because it's too difficult. 3%, okay, we need to be more more clear <laughs> to to uh, to to uh, help you to understand these uh, these notebooks. No, because of time, but surely uh, I surely will. Okay, uh, we, we count on you to do that, <laughs> and we know two weeks is it's short. Okay, no, because it's not the kind of exercise that I'm looking for. Just one percent. Okay, it's not bad. It's not so bad. <laughs> Thank you for this. After your participation to this workshop, you feel more confident to use a Copernicus service product. Okay. It's very good, very good for us. It's very encouraging for us to see that. Okay, let's continue. And do you think the skippers Alex Thompson and Samantha Davis are using <laughs> to optimize the routes and with the Vendée Globe? Yes, for sure. Okay. And 16%? They don't know what we are talking about. You don't know the Vendée Globe. Oh, you need you need to 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 check on the on the internet what is the what is the Vendée Globe race. <laughs> okay, thank you for your participation. It's very interesting. Okay, so now I'd let the floor to uh, to Robert to introduce uh, the next speaker, and I. Uh, uh, I hope you, you will enjoy this uh, debriefing session. Okay, thank you, Fabrice. Um, so, first, we are going to hear from Alina Demidio, who's a Copernicus Marine User Support Expert, um, working for Mercator Ocean International. She's dealing with all kinds of uh, the daily user requests to help uh, the Copernicus users. Um, and she's going to be talking uh, to us about the registration um, process and extraction and visualization. Thanks, Alina. Hello, everyone. I hope you hear me, you see me. So we will start, I'm here to represent the service desk. So I'm here to answer to the most general question uh, about the website. So it was like registration, extraction, or visualiz visualization. Uh, we will start with some questions that are the most general that we encounter the most of the time. So the first one is from Priscilla. Does the marine data cover all the ocean worldwide or just around the Europe? Actually, we have data covering the globe. 
but we have also some products uh, who are focused on six regions. So for example, we have mid, um, mid sea data. So for the Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, Baltic Sea, Arctic Ocean, and the Iberian Bas uh, Biscay Ireland region. And also, of course, the Northwest Shelf Seas, which is the, the subject of the training of this session. Another question is, is there any size limit for downloading the data or say max one gigabyte from Mohamed? In this case, in general, if you want to subset the data, so downloading directly by subset, subsetting or direct get file, uh, you have to expect the limit of size for the final data. So you cannot oversize, overpass one gig of data. If you uh, use the FTP link, you can uh, you can download more than one giga, so you don't have a restriction of size. But in this case, the data you download the complete data, so you cannot subset the data is for the global uh, geographical area and for all the variables and the and the old theme range you choose. But if you, there is a problem with the size, the size file for the moment, because if you need some records that involves several years, the download could fail, no matter what the file's uh, size is. So in this case, we suggest you to contact the service desk. Me or we are one of my teammates, we will work on it and send you the, the files. And the last question is always from Ahmed. And it asks uh, if is it possible to subset and download the uh, data using the FTP. Unfortunately, for the moment, it's not yet possible to subset the data from the FTP before downloading. But after the download, you have the data, you have the file, you have the NetCDF net file. So in this case, you will have to, you will be able to cut and manipulate the data as you want to, to subset that. But for the moment, when you take the data from the FTP file, you have the the data in the complete and original form. So now, if you have any other question, uh, I'm here at your disposal. I have some few minutes, ten minutes, I think. Robert, I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, I think we've uh, got a question that's related to the notebooks that's come up. Um, And otherwise, if you, for the moment, you don't have any question, we are at your disposal. So you can contact us via mail or also in the website. Now there is a small chat, interactive chat. So you can send us to a message and we answer via chat. It's going to be more faster and intuitive and you will have your answer. So the first question we have is, uh, any guidance on exporting the due to notebooks, um, e.g. to a local file? I um, don't know if that's something you know, Elena, it's, uh, if not I can answer it. I, so, I honestly, I don't really understand the, the, the question, I, need to, I would like to, so you, to know better. Okay. Um, when, I think, as people are asking about the, the notebooks for uh, working on their own own systems. Um, when you have your, when you're logged into your Jupyter Lab, um, you should be able to, where you have the notebook you're selecting, if you right click, um, there should be a number of options, including about halfway down the list, uh, the option to download the notebook, um, and this should save the Jupyter notebook to a local file. Um, then you'll also have to do the same with the, the data files if you want to, to run it with the data files we provided as well. But um, yeah, that's the, the best way I know of to, to get the notebooks onto your local system. Um, let's see if there's any more questions coming up. This is uh, the last chance to ask uh, our experts uh, live. So if there is anything you want to know um, and have a quick answer to, this is the time to ask. Do you see my screen? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'd like to share my screen. Okay. You are on the Jupyter uh, uh, Hub environment, and this is, a, for example, uh, a Jupyter notebook. And as Rob said, you have just to right click, and then you choose download to download your 
a Jupyter uh, notebook on your computer. And then if you install Anaconda, for example, this is a, a, the software uh, allows you to uh, uh, add Jupyter, uh, a Jupyter account on your computer. You can, uh, you can play with, uh, with your notebook uh, directly on your computer. Okay. So, one more question. Okay, I have had issues in NetCDF trying to stack two different products corresponding to different time frames as the coordinates didn't match exactly. Have you come across this and is there an easy solution? I use X array. Um, can't say I've come across this uh, at all. I don't know if any of other experts have. Um, I think in this case, you, if you want to do this operation in just one script, you have to be very, very careful because the, the products and the data set could make confused. So in just where one request is not possible, but yeah, I'm not you sure. Have this, to, uh, you have to create a, script, a Python script, especially for that, because with the classic way to download, it's not possible to create a, just one NetCDF for, for two different products in different time range. So we have to, if you if you need, we you can send us the, the script and we can watch on it and help you. But in the classic way that we use usually to, to download a NetCDF fi file, this is not possible. So we have to work on it. If you need, we are, we are here for that. Uh, okay. Um, someone asking they found an animation in the results folder for the physical model products notebook. Uh, not find this was uh, where this was produced. Uh, so I, I can answer this one, Dagmar. I think that's a uh, that was a an example of um, how you could use the data using a package called Open Drift um, that, to use current data to plot the trajectory of drifters. Um, we decided not to use it in the in the final um, training notebooks, but it's uh, if you download Anaconda, as Fabrice suggested, uh, to use download Jupyter notebooks and also the Open Drift um, package, you'll be able to uh, explore that and, and use the data to produce those sorts of animations. But no, the, it, the animation and the results wasn't uh, produced directly by the the products, uh, the notebook we have on the, the lab at the moment. So another question, is it possible to use those bits of code from the notebooks in Python to achieve the same results? Or do we have to install the Jupyter notebooks on our PC? Um, so uh, that shouldn't be a problem. You should be able to copy the, um, the code cells um, and they should form a Python script on their own um, without the, the text descriptions in between. Um, so that is another way you can um, run the notebook or the code within the notebooks. Um, you don't have to use Jupyter, it's just Jupyter uh, notebooks are a, um, a nice way to present the code, um, especially to, to new users. So if I try to open NetCDF files in software like ArcGIS or Erdas, imagine to create some easy visualizations in already existing products. Uh, it was very difficult to handle the NetCDF data. Is there any kind of extension add-on to allow this in a more handy way? Um, so for Bree Selina, I don't know. I'm not familiar with using ArcGIS extensively. I don't know. Uh, we know. more use the free version of ArcGIS, the QGIS. In this case, there is a video where we, it's easier to, to insert 
the net CDF to visualize it on QGIS because it's almost automatic. So you just need to select the net CDF file and open it on QGIS. Unfortunately, I don't have ArcGIS, so I cannot help you in that way. But I mean, if you try to use QGIS, it's gonna be, I think it's more more useful and more easier also to, to visualize them. But I can, I can try to, to figure it out. Just need to, to have a bit more information. We'll send you a small tutorial to do that if you contact us. Yes, I, I, I just uh, post a comment on with a, with a link on the, exactly. the list of uh, GIS uh, tutorial videos to, uh, uh, to, to access NetCDF data uh, with uh, QGIS. I think uh, QGIS and ArcGIS are using the are same, the same yeah. GIS uh, uh, philosophy to access uh, data, and NetCDF is not well. Uh, it's very difficult to read NetCDF with uh, this kind of tool, but uh, you will find some uh, good information on these uh, tutorial videos. We have some, uh, today we have four, and we're going to have uh, six uh, tutorial videos on GIS uh, tool and how to, to load NetCDF data. So, any more questions? So for the moment, I think. Uh, in any case, if you will have some question after, or you will have some issues. You have to contact us. You can contact the service desk, and we will find a solution. If it's not in that moment, and from us, we will ask to the expert in that case, or, or we will figure out your problem. There is no problem. There is, we are sure about that. Okay, and uh, Elena, you 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 stay with us. During the yeah, yeah, stay here. If they have some question, I will answer in the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank no you. Okay, so uh, as uh, we move on then to our next um, experts, uh, will be um, I think yeah, the next slide. So, So we're going to be hearing uh, some of the answers to your questions about in situ observations. So these will be presented by Eric Campo and uh, Paz Rotland. So Eric uh, uh, is working at the German Federal Marine Agency, BSH, um, and I think he'll be starting. And then Paz uh, is working with Soviet Data Center, um, should be answering some of the questions too. So uh, morning, Eric and Paz, i hand over to you. Good morning. Good morning, good day to everyone. Um, let's start with the first question, which is a question from Dagmar. And uh, it goes like this. Is there a way to find out what particular data entered a certain CMEMS data set, say data from a particular cruise? For some scientific applications, one needs to know this when doing comparisons. Um, all platforms that have contributed with observations to any in situ product or data set, um, they are listed in um, the, the index platform uh, file. So the quickest way to, uh, to check if a platform is included in, in our product is by looking directly uh, in, 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 into this index platform file and uh, by looking for for its uh, platform code, uh, the platform code of the uh, of the platform, or its uh, WMO code. Um, got question number two, which is going to be answered by my colleague. Okay, thank you, Eric. So uh, yes, I was questioning about this in the last uh, intervention uh, we had. And it's about if we are going to 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 deploy some kind of a API for dealing with the in situ data, and if this API is going to serve a GeoJSON uh, format. 
And the answer is yes, this is projected for 2021. And the first thing you are going to, to find available is an RDAP API. And this RDAP API will serve uh, your JSON data. So it's a matter of time, yes. And here is the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Do you plan to add CDOM, question number three, do you plan to add CDOM data from biogeochemical Argo data? This is a question which was addressed by Raphael. Um, and uh, the answer is um, parameter CDOM is already uh, being managed uh, by the in tech. You can have, you can have, a, uh, you can, ha um, you can, uh, there is a full list of parameters uh, and under this uh, URL. And uh, well, so as long as an Argo profiler is reporting um, a parameter CDOM, uh, this means that it will appear in our products. Question number four, please, Pat. Oh, okay, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so although this uh, workshop is focusing in the Northwest Shell area, uh, we have also in situ products for the global ocean that is covering the Indian Ocean. No? Um, well, uh, if you click on the following slide, the answer is there. But uh, the, the thing is that if this user knows about some Thai gorges that are missing in the global product uh, covering the, the um, Indian Ocean, I, I just uh, suggest uh, this uh, person to contact this uh, email uh, because this is the way we will uh, um, attend the, the, the notification. Uh, we will try to integrate these platforms that uh, are probably missing. Um, so just uh, please uh, contact us and we will try to integrate these uh, Taigoyes. Yeah. So in this case, I also answered this during the last session. But uh, well, uh, what I suggested to this user is to go to the use case uh, section in the main website of the Copernicus Marine Service. And in this use uh, case uh, section, you can filter uh, by uh, safety and disaster uh, use cases. And you will find uh, like uh, a summary of the downstream application dealing with this uh, topic. And in those um, applications, you will find the, a contact person. And I suggest you to, to contact this, uh, this person to get to know better about their uh, approach regarding uh, safety and disaster. This is the, the way I will do it. I will do it. So I suggest this this way. Well, if you got any more questions, uh, okay. as before, as stated before, uh, here is our uh, uh, email address and uh, both, I mean, two email, email addresses where you can just, uh, well, first of all, uh, you have the chat here, so you can directly um, and, um, Okay, uh, looks like we have some uh, questions coming through, hopefully soon. Thank you, uh, Eric and Paz, for that. Um, so if anyone has any questions now about in situ products. Um, okay, so we've got a question here from Dagmar. Um, Seagull and groups often submit near real-time data that is not finally uh, calibrated. The calibrated data often follows later. Both versions contained in uh, the Copernicus Marine Service uh, data, or does the final version replace the preliminary version? Yes, uh, in this in this we have two two ways of uh, um, dealing with this. Uh, 
uh, delay time uh, data, if we can call it this way. One, if it is regarding calibration of a link, what we do is to create a second variable called uh, underscore adjusted, okay, that contains the, um, the calibrated version of the data. We still keep the real time, but we produce this other adjusted variable uh, that uh, contains the calibrated data. So this is the, the way it uh, works uh, oftenly. And the second way is uh, that we uh, um, make the replacement, you suggest. Uh, we have a real-time series, and uh, we revisit distant series with the uh, calibrated data. And this is a, a mixed series in the end uh, over time. And this is how it, it works. Okay, thanks, Vas. Um, are there any more questions? So, Ludwig has a question. What is the reason why historical data... Oh. Yeah. This is like a, sorry, uh, we are looking at an answer, no? Or, or uh, yeah, okay. oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so why, why are there uh, not tide gauge data before 2000? You mean in the Norway cell area? I, maybe uh, Eric knows the reason, but uh, there is no, no reason for that. If the Tide is reporting data uh, earlier, in the 90s, for, for example, it has to be there in the product. I don't, I, I, so, I really don't know. I would have to, I would have to um, investigate why there is, there isn't any data before the year 2000. Um, it's, it's weird to me. I, I've, I've uh, worked with uh, Taigoji's data, uh, you know, older than, than that. Uh, no. So I don't know. It maybe is uh, some provider in particular or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Might be. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question from Fabrice. Do you know what is the record for time at uh, sea for an in situ platform? Um, in general, how much time uh, can an in situ platform be, be operational? Uh, for example, I, I know there are platforms that have been drifting over uh, seven, seven years or something like that. So, but I, I, I cannot say this is the record, <laughs> but this is uh, something I, I know, for example. That's, uh, that's quite a long time, so it seems to me. <laughs> uh, thanks, Pass. Have a few more minutes if anyone has more questions about in situ platforms. see some people typing so maybe there'll be some more questions no more okay questions. i mean now's the time <laughs> yes and if you um, have some some question in mind and you don't want to use the chat please contact us later with the email that is provided yes for instance Lud ludwig um you can, uh, maybe you can write down your your or send an email to uh, to one of these email addresses, and with your email with your email address, and I can answer back. Same thing to to Dagmar about the cal calibrated uh, variables, the adjusted ones. 
I, I don't like to answer this by by email because I can provide examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a, another question uh, here. What are the next important innovations uh, in situ instruments um, that you're waiting for in the near future? Mm. Mm, I'm not waiting any any anyone in particular. I don't know you, Eric. Um, um, next important innovation about in situ instruments. You mean instruments in, I, installed uh, in, in the platforms, or what? 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 What do you mean exactly? What, yes, so, something like that. I mean, I mean, for example, recently we have added uh, sail drones. No. Uh, yeah, before, that's. I was thinking. A, that. Yeah. It's a, the most uh, recent uh, innovation regarding the uh, new instrument or platform because in this right. case the instrument are inter integrated in the in the platform so it's uh, more or less the same but uh, we are not expecting something like that uh, in the near future no uh, yeah, but we don't know the providers always surprise us so <laughs> yeah who knows hmm. I, mean, I suppose the uh, this is a bio argo array um providing lots of data or expected to provide um, uh, new measurements or uh, variables that you aren't currently included? Uh, BioArgos are already being integrated in the system and they are always progressing in new instrumentation, of course. Yes, so we will benefit from that for sure. But this is a development that occurs in the provider side, so we benefit from it, but we don't really know Sailors, I like uh, sailing mini mini sailing boats or something like that, <laughs> uh, that basically drifts uh, with the wind and uh, they uh, go sampling uh, uh, and reporting data uh, regarding temperature of the seawater and also they, they have meteo, meteo instrumentation, so also uh, they provide data about wind along the track they, they perform. So, and if you visit the notebooks, uh, I think you have examples about the sail drones, if I recall properly. No, no, not in the Norway self, uh, in other sessions. In the Mediterranean session, we have an example, and you can check the video tutorials to see what it exactly this uh, sail drone. Okay, um, I've, I've got a, uh, a quick question. Um, does the uh, in situ products contain um, any short lived uh, sort of research based um, uh, observations, for example, from um, marine mammal tags? Um, I know there's been some data collected from seal mounted tags. I was wondering if, if any of that data is uh, made available or is there a possibility in the future? Uh, there is marine. Uh mammal uh, data already in the in the system yes and we might include another another sources uh, but it's not uh, it's not something we can ens ensure uh, i know for example some providers are working with uh, tag uh, sea turtles for example and we can envisage to integrate this uh, at some point for sure uh, but uh, as the but first the provider has to to release this uh, data and they are still keeping it uh, for curation so let's let's see okay great thanks for that. Um, i have a question here from dagmar there are groups that still report temperature um, on ipts 68 scales whilst others use its 90 um, is this homogenized in the in situ data this is this question is a little bit obscure to me <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Eric, if you understand the question uh, better nope. now. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. <laughs> nope. Never heard of IPTS 68. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I guess as before, uh, perhaps. As before, we can write down the question and answer back later. Yes, hopefully we can check uh, the IPTS. Uh, hmm. Okay, great. Um, don't see any more questions. Uh, maybe there's another question coming through, if, if not. Uh, we'll move 
move on, I guess, if there's no more questions. Okay. Oh. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah Compass. Uh, thank you. It's a great session. Um, so we'll next be looking um, at ocean color products, and uh, Sylvia, who uh, was our expert from the previous session, will be answering some questions for us. Um, uh, Sylvia is an ocean color scientist at Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Um, morning, Sylvia. Hi. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'll hand over to you for your, uh, your questions. Good, thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Okay. Um, so I've highlighted a couple of questions only, but they are quite, uh, well, quite, uh, quite relevant for, for ocean color, and also they are quite uh, difficult to answer. So that's why I've only included two, uh, because I wanted to give a, a, a good explanation. Um, so the first one is uh, obviously when I show you during the presentation the timeline of the different ocean color sensors that were available in the past and will be available in the future. Um, uh, the main question is how we integrate all those to create the multi-sensor match uh, reprocess or near real time or delay time product. So this is uh, this question from uh, uh, Angela um, asking uh, how uh, the atmospheric correction is, is applied in each one of the sensors. So, um, as you know, uh, the light travels between uh, the sea surface and the sensor across the atmosphere. So, obviously, it's going to be um, interacting with all the molecules in the atmosphere. So, the atmospheric correction is the main source of uh, uncertainties or errors in the final um, observation. And so, there are several atmospheric correction processors available. Uh, for example, you have the ESA standard, which is called MEX, the NASA standard, which is called LTGEN, uh, and then you have more experimental, so to speak, atmospheric corrections, uh, such as Polymer, which I'm um, showing in there. Uh, I have a link in there for, for uh, Polymer. is um, developed by a company called Hagius in, in France. And there are other um, atmospheric corrections for uh, more optically uh, complex waters, uh, such as C2RCC. They are really good for uh, uh, retrievals in case two waters. So those are turbid waters um, or um, areas where you have a, a lot of aerosols, for example, near to the coast. Um, so at the moment, uh, as I'm summarizing in here, we use LTGN, which is the standard NASA uh, atmospheric correction, uh, and we apply that uh, to data from sea waves, MODIS, Aqua, and Beers. And we use Polymer for Maris and Olchi at the moment. So as you know, Olchi is the latest uh, Alquis, uh, the, the latest uh, member of the ocean color family uh, uh, on board the Sentinel 3A and B. So um, from those two, I, I wanted to highlight that Polymer, uh, because the original question uh, was actually focused on Sanglin. Polymer is particularly good at retrieving um, ocean color data in really tricky situations. So that is the presence of Sanglin, which in basically that means that the sunlight is being reflected back uh, straight away uh, from the surface of the ocean uh, to the sensor. So it's the same thing as we, as you suddenly uh, just turn a corner and you look at the sun and you're partially blinded for a second. It's exactly the same thing for the sensor. So to be able to retrieve uh, data on the, that condition is quite tricky. Uh, Polymer is able to do that uh, because it doesn't rely, most atmospheric corrections rely on the hypothesis that the uh, signal in the near infrared and short sort of wave infrared is practically uh, zero uh, for uh, clean or um, um, open ocean waters. Uh, polymer doesn't rely on that assumption, so it uses the whole spectrum. So it's able to uh, detect data or acquire data under conditions uh, where that near infrared uh, or short sort of wave infrared uh, signal is not zero. And that means also in, in terms of uh, other um, uh, situations, for example, when you have haze or dust in the atmosphere, polymer is actually quite good 
uh, in these situations. So this obviously leads to uh, a lot of more data uh, and, and that improves the spatial coverage uh, compared with other atmospheric corrections. Uh, and the second question kind of touches on on the atmospheric correction as well, but it's it's more broad in the in the uh, in the sense that how do we merge the the rest of the um, the rest of the um, uh, products? So, uh, for example, for the uh, rep or the reprocess data set, uh, we have the top of atmosphere radiances coming from all the different sensors. We apply the atmospheric correction as we were just saying. And uh, that means that we bring all uh, the measurements from the top of the atmosphere back to the, um, uh, to the surface of the ocean. So we obtain what we call remote sensing reflectances. Then we bin all them together. And that means uh, that we apply some flagging and then we aggregate all the data uh, on a certain time period. So that's usually one day worth of data. Uh, then we do the band shifting. So as you will remember from the presentation, the different sensors, ocean color sensors, have different spectral um, characteristics. So the, the a spectrum or the band uh, center wavelengths are quite different from one or the other. So we have chosen C without the sensor of reference, and we then band shift everything to, to that reference. Uh, then we do a bias correction. So obviously the calibration between sensors is slightly different. That means that uh, using the whole time series, you can compare the, the, the bits that overlap uh, from one sensor to the other, and you can maybe detect uh, or have a measure of the bias between the two of them. And then you can apply that so uh, you can merge easily. So the next step is obviously merge all of these together. And at the end, you have a multi-sensor remote sensing reflectance uh, product which is uh, um, provided in the CMMS catalog. On top of that, then we apply the regional chlorophyll algorithm. So that's basically the answer uh, to that question uh, on the uh, previous slide is uh, that the chlorophyll product uh, or the chlorophyll algorithm is already applied, is applied on the already merged remote sensing reflectances. And this question also have a part two and uh, asking about how we validate. So um, that uh, I think I have a couple of slides on the presentation, so you, you should still have access to that. So you can refer back to that, but just as a reminder that we have uh, two types of uh, validation for the ocean color products in the uh, Northwest Shelf uh, catalog. Uh, the first one is offline validation. So that's what most people understand as validation is a comparison between in situ data and satellite data. And then we have the online validation that gets updated every day. And that means that we are comparing uh, two types of satellite data. So we have climatologies that give you uh, an idea of the average value for one day. Uh, and that actually they uh, satellite data value. So our description of all that, uh, the, both the validation methods and results are available in the quits and the quality information documents. But as you will see, uh, we have a set of metrics, so um, like slope, intercept, remote, um, um, root mean square error, bias, uh, Pearson correlation coefficient. So all those metrics are explained on the quit, and you will see what the typical values are. And, um, and the actual results for the validation exercises uh, for both the regional seas and the global seas. And I think, yeah, I think that's my, my last slide. So if you have any uh, other questions, now's the time. Okay, uh, we've already got a question here. Um, thank you, Sylvia. Um, um, uh, some words about atmospheric correction problem in the boundary um, between land and water. Yeah, this is also, um, also very relevant. So there's two things in here. So the first one is the uh, what we call the adjacency effect. So that means that uh, obviously the land and the sea reflect uh, light very differently. And one of the signal is affecting the other on the boundary uh, between land and water. So uh, this that's quite tricky to detect, but something that needs to be taken into account. As a result, what happens uh, with many of the ocean uh, products at the moment is that if you look at the other products as they come from the agencies, you will have a gap 
uh, along the coast, basically. So most of those pixels are flagged as uh, low quality. But a good atmospheric correction should be able to retrieve uh, uh, data on that. The second question, the second issue here, apart from adjacent, is the fact that closer to the coast, the optical characteristics of water are very different from the open ocean. So you have, uh, if you've done the uh, Python notebooks, if you've done the, the last one, um, you will have uh, very turbid waters, as, as we saw on the third uh, Jupiter notebook. You will have um, high uh, sediment concentration, low transparency. So a good atmospheric correction uh, should also be able to have a case one, case two switch. So case one being open waters that are mostly basically contain water molecules and case two waters that are optically complex. Okay, Sylvia, um, I think we have another comment. So how's, how's this problem solved in the old tree? Um, so if uh, if we're still talking about yeah this this issue, uh, um, the answer is um, that atmospheric corrections are still being adapted for OCHI and SMI, but it's not a matter of the atmospheric correction per se. So in, in particular, uh, for OCHI, which is my more of my area of expertise, so more of a Sentinel three rather than a Sentinel two person myself. Um, we have seen a uh, very good results for polymer already. The problem is that you don't have a, a time series that long enough to actually assess the. So if polymer needs to be retuned, so to speak, for Olchi, uh, we won't be able to do that until Olchi is uh, um, older, basically. Uh, so, but the uh, prospect is is quite good. So the atmospheric corrections at the moment are quite. Uh, Solid. It's, it's, it's the same for SMI and maybe Landsat 8, which is quite different, quite, quite similar to SMI. We have um, uh, atmospheric corrections uh, or processors such as Acolyte, and they are quite good at uh, not only coastal waters but also inland waters, which is uh, also very relevant for these high resolution uh, sensors that are actually able to look at small reservoirs or lakes or rivers, for example. Okay, uh, another question here now. Um, would it make sense to compute some chlorophyll turbidity data from Sentinel-2 sensor um, and validate the outcome of ocean color products with low resolution? Um, would you suggest another strategy? So uh, first thing, I wouldn't call it the validation. So you, you can easily do a comparison, yes. Uh, actually, for me, it will make, make more sense doing the opposite. So you will validate the, the lower solution ocean color product with a high resolution. Uh, my, by, I mean, my advice, obviously, uh, for me, the best strategy uh, would be to compare within C2 data. But I imagine uh, that if you're asking that, it's because the um, in situ data is very sparse in the region. Um, so uh, two things um, in here. Uh, to be able to do a fair comparison, you have to uh, take into account if you if you look at the quits and, and we explain a little bit the uh, validation uh, method, uh, you will see that we extract uh, macro pixels. So you have to take into account that those macro pixels have to have the same size, obviously, because uh, you need to be looking at the same surface in the ocean to be able to compare fairly. So that means that for Sentinel uh, two, you will have a really big macro pixel. So depending on the area, the uh, variability in the turbidity will be very high. So that's a problem. <laughs> so to avoid that problem, I will probably look at time series of average values if you have enough data, rather than looking at matchups, the one-to-one matchups. So that's another strategy. Um, um, yeah, that's that's basically what I what I would suggest in this case. Okay. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I think we might have some more questions coming through shortly. Um, so have some people typing. Um, in the meantime, I have a quick question, I think. Um, you mentioned uh, for the coastal regions, um, the products switch between case one and case two um, algorithms. Uh, does the point at which these switch vary with time, um, or are they fixed designated um, zones that are used throughout the year? 
Uh, yeah, it does vary with time. So obviously some regions have a, a very uh, particular seasonality. Uh, so if you look at, uh, I mean, you can you can look at this from two perspectives. So purely chlorophyll, obviously chlorophyll in some regions is higher during the um, during the, um, the spring, autumn. But that's probably not cal catalogued as case two. It's more uh, the switch between uh, oligotrophic and mesotrophic, for example. For case two uh, in coastal areas, uh, the main um, drivers are the tides. And also, again, coming back to, to the region uh, we are looking at, uh, which has a lot of rivers uh, uh, providing inputs into the sea. Obviously, those inputs uh, depend on the weather. So the higher the uh, uh, river, uh, so the rain rainfall uh, really uh, affects a river uh, inputs, for example. Or if you have areas where you have ice and melting ice, that will probably increase uh, the case two characteristics during the spring after meltdown. So yeah, that's that's a problem. So you can't really say this pixel or this region is case two uh, forever. You have to take yeah. into account the spectrum uh, for each observation. And then uh, 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 again, a, a good atmospheric correction should be able to do that, not rely on set uh, regions but just look at the spectrum and be able to, to derive the characteristics from, from that. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I say, I think uh, a related question similar mm -hmm. from Samantha about uh, yeah, case one and case two waters. And it's yeah. defined for each image. Um, so it's not defined. Uh, we've developed a, a chlorophyll algorithm that so for the remissance and reflectances, it doesn't really matter if it's case one or case two. So it's just uh, so the uh, best atmospheric correction for that pixel has been already been applied. So uh, uh, for the different sensors, as I said on the previous slides, you have either L2GN or polymer. Uh, and then for chlorophyll, uh, we have uh, uh, derived uh, or developed a, a regional algorithm that is case one, case two. So you have two regimes and you switch between the two of them with a linear regime. So, um, is there a data set somewhere defining this? Um, not a data set, but on the documentation, you can see the definition for this switch between the, the two of them. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's Great. I think we have time for another question or two. Uh, so, any comments on increased quality using Arbin's? I'm not familiar. So I, 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 I work with people from Arbenz, but I, I'm not quite sure what this uh, means. Sorry, yeah. if you, Carl, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit. Uh, do they have their own regional algorithm or? Uh, Didn't see any typing in the chat. Maybe Carl can elaborate. We can move on to the next. So um, another question: How did you measure chlorophyll ground truth? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the old-fashioned way. Basically, we send uh, <laughs> ships out <laughs> to collect uh, samples of water that then go back to the laboratory, and there's the chlorophyll concentration derived using. Uh, HPLC techniques. And then we have the indirect uh, chlorophyll ground truth derivation, which also relies um, on campaigns. But basically, what you're measuring are the uh, bio optical characteristics of the water. As uh, So you have a ship, you have uh, this system uh, in the kind of in the bottom where you have the water flowing all the, all the time and you're measuring the optical characteristics all the time. And then you have a bio optical model that relates those measurements, so things are the absorption and um, backscatter and coefficients to the chlorophyll concentration. So we call that ACS uh, derived chlorophyll, uh, which again should be described on the quality information documents if you are more interested. Uh, that means that we have a lot of measure measurements per campaign rather than one sample per Per, sorry, one measure per sample, as is the case with HPLC. 
Okay, thanks, Sylvia. That's another question from Tobias. How do data products reflect areas with a very low water depth, where, for example, the sea ground could be misinterpreted as very high turbidity? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, what we, <clears throat> as you know, as as you know, no, sorry, as you say, um, there is no way to to untie those uh, those signals. So, there you rely basically on um, complementary information that comes from altimetry. So that altimetry uh, is used to write flags. Uh, that basically tell you that the, uh, the depth is <clears throat> sorry, and the depth is is very low. Uh, so those pixels, unfortunately, at the moment are usually uh, masked out because you cannot really rely on the on the um, chlorophyll or remote sensing reflectance uh, value that you're looking at. Okay, um, I don't know if we have. Uh, yep, time for another question. Are algorithms uh, you implement open source and available, um, for example, on GitHub? Uh, the code is not open source, uh, uh, but uh, just um, yeah, I don't, I yeah, um, don't really know. I mean, there's no actual proper reason why, because the algorithms are defined on papers that are publicly available. So anyone with a paper can implement their own. So maybe there's no, uh, they are quite system specific. So they, they basically, they are designed to work on the Copernicus Marine processing chain we have in house. So I think that's why we've never bothered probably doing it open source. But if you look at the algorithms themselves, things like OC5, for example, uh, they are actually super easy to implement on Python. Okay. Uh, thanks, Silver. I don't know if we should uh, wrap this up for our coffee break now. It's half past eight. Sounds good. Uh, just a comment from Carl. Um, So I think there is another survey to come as well, Fabrice, is that right? Yes. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank and you. thank you uh, to all the experts uh, in uh, from the beginning and Elena uh, for this first part. Um, yes, we have a, a short survey during the, uh, the, the this coffee break. Um, and because we are not obliged to, uh, to follow strictly the agenda, I propose you to have just uh, 10 minutes of, um, of um, uh, coffee break, virtual coffee break, to let you the time to answer the question and, uh, uh, and make your, your, your coffee. And uh, uh, stay online. The, the, the webinar is still running, uh, but uh, we, can, uh, we can meet again uh, in uh, 10 minutes. OK, so uh, be back at uh, 10, uh, uh, 45, um, say uh, time, okay? And prepare your question for the next part. Be ready. Yes, sir. And <laughs> our next uh, talk will be on the, the physical products, I think. Uh, with you? No, with uh, Marina. With Marina, with Marina yeah. And then bio and wave uh, products after that, I think. Okay, cool. So we're back. And in a few minutes, uh, we will start again this uh, second part with uh, Marina Tonani on the physical model product. But you have uh, one or two minutes to, to, to continue uh, the survey or to prepare your coffee. Okay. I would like to share with you some uh, my screen on the virtual regatta offshore game <laughs> because we talk at the beginning of this workshop. Um, we talked about uh, uh, the Vendée Globe, the sailing race uh, around the globe, and uh, there is a virtual game you can uh, uh, you you can compete with. Uh, with a real skipper on a, on a virtual game and there will be people 
uh, in this game or participating uh, at this game, there is a lot uh, more than uh, 800,000 of participants. So it's uh, it's huge, and uh, oh, it's funny! It's funny! It's funny! Take a long time to to load. Sorry for that. So you have access to weather forecast to choose your direction in that game, but not yet the the, the Copernicus Marine Service currents or the wave. <laughs> Perhaps in the in the next edition, in four years. So I don't know if there is some uh, participants of uh, this workshop today who are competing on this uh, virtual regatta game. I can share with you this uh, this address. And for the information, I'm not very good because you have to spend a lot of time to uh, to <laughs> to to be a good competitor on this game. Uh, to change sales uh, regarding the, the weather condition. And uh, I have just time to, to have a look uh, one time per day, so it's complicated to, to be a, a good competitor. <laughs> so, Robert is back. So, we will not show the, uh, the results of this survey because we don't have uh, time for that. Uh, so I propose you to, to start the second part of uh, of this webinar. So I let the floor to, to Robert and Marina. Uh, thank you, Fabrice. Um, so yes, our next uh, question session is on the physical products. Um, it's going to be answered by Marina Tanani. She's uh, um, the manager and leader of the uh, Chelsea's team at the Met Office. Um, she'll be talking about the, the physical products. Um, so if you have any questions uh, for this live session, don't forget to ask those in the chat. And morning, Rina, I'll uh, hand over to you. Good morning to everybody. So I hope you are enjoying this uh, the briefing session. So um, I will uh, try to answer questions that uh, have been uh, um, written in the chat. And so uh, there is a, a, a very general question that I think is very probably interesting for all the users for understanding uh, what, what, how to best use the forecast and why we do a new forecast every day. And so this is the question raised by Ayman. Uh, and, uh, so I don't know if uh, you remember from my presentation where I was showing how the production cycle is, uh, 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 is working, where we run the system for uh, each forecast cycle for 48 hours back in the past so that we can uh, uh, get all the observation for improving the model initial condition and be sure that uh, we start the forecast with the best initial condition ever, and then we run the forecast for six days. And so here is just a, um, a picture taken from the Copernicus web page, where there is also a um, part that is dedicated to the validation and verification of all the products that are delivered, and uh, is a validation of SST for uh, the different forecast lead time. So is uh, for the same day, uh, how good uh, compared to uh, in situ observation has been uh, the forecast that was produced the same day, the uh, day before and uh, uh, so on. And as you can see, so the um, light blue line is the analysis, so it's where we use the observations for uh, apply a correction to the model. It's the most accurate with uh, the lowest uh, error. And then uh, uh, with the increasing of the forecast lead time, 
we are also increasing uh, the error associated with the information that we uh, do provide. So uh, it's clear that uh, the best option would be whenever it's possible to use the latest available forecast and then to update it on daily basis as it is uh, as soon as it is updated on the Copernicus catalog so that you can benefit of the most accurate uh, information. Then, of course, this uh, um, validation is based on observations and so we need to have enough observation for uh, doing an accurate uh, verification of our forecast degradation uh, during the increased uh, lead time. Uh, and it's not always easy to make this assessment. But I think that could be a good example to show you uh, how the quality of the forecast can be affected when we are projecting into uh, the future. And for us, the future is uh, a matter of uh, uh, five, six days. So, another question that uh, uh, we got from uh, German is uh, uh, about uh, the um, current product and uh, uh, in particular if uh, we are including also the um, components of the currents that is due to tide and wave as it is done for the global products. And so, uh, and uh, the answer is yes. This information is already available for the Norway Shelf and starting from the catalog update of the 15th of December will be even more accurate because uh, the ocean and the wave model uh, are going to be coupled and so there will be a better consistency uh, among the components provided by the ocean and uh, the wave. Tides are included in the Nova Shelf product, in the current and the total uh, currents that we provide from the model. And so unless you are using the, the tide products that are the daily mains product, you have the tidal signal that is automatically included in uh, the information that uh, you get. And uh, you can easily combine the um, physical product uh, horizontal velocity that is available to the catalog with the wave component that is the only one that is missing because, as I said, the tides is already um, included in the ocean horizontal component. And uh, you can add them. And uh, the two models are running, are delivered on exactly the same grid. And so there are no issues about uh, interpolation or different uh, geographical locations. And we have added a specific session in the product user manual for the, um, uh, that will be updated with the December release, uh, explaining into details how you can do this. So if you have a so you can raise a question in the chat. Anytime you can contact the um, uh, Copernicus Service Desk so that they can provide you all the information you need and they can also get in contact with us if you need a very specific information for an our shelf product. Thanks, Marina. Um, so now's uh, the time if anyone wants uh, an answer to a question about the physical products or uh, perhaps something more general, if not. But um, now's the time to ask it in the chat. This is uh, the last opportunity to have a live interaction with their, with their experts. So, um, yeah, anything, anything you, you're con concerned or have a, an interest in, uh, just... Uh, Feel free to ask now.
So no question for the moment. Um, I don't see anyone typing anything just yet. Marina, you said that you are following the, the race on the globe. What are your favorite yeah. sailors? Ah, <laughs> it's a difficult question. So the, among all the sailors, there is only one that I met and I was sailing with some years ago. And so okay. she's Miranda Meron, and so I'm following her. Okay. On, on his boat? Did you say yes. on his boat? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then, of course, there is a one only Italian participating <laughs> to the race, that is Giancarlo Pedota, and of course, I'm supporting him too. Okay. He's done pretty well, actually. He yeah. has uh, gained a few positions in the last uh, um, day, so. Some uh, unofficial uh, Copernicus uh, support for <laughs> sailors. Um, no questions coming through. So everyone, maybe everyone is uh, taking a trip to their uh, co coffee machines. So. <laughs> <laughs> All of the explanations were uh, clear, crystal clear. <laughs> So I think we can can continue. Thank okay. you, Marina. Uh, if, if anyone Thank does you. have any questions that comes to them later, then uh, again, there's the email addresses you can send them to, um, or type them in the chat, and uh, we'll try to address them um, at a later time. Uh, thanks, Marina. Thank you. So moving on now to uh, this my turn. Um, so I'll be uh, answering some questions about the uh, biogeochemical products. Um, so I'm working at the Met Office, um, producing, working on the, the near real time and analysis uh, biogeochemical products. So we'll have a look at a couple of questions that come up um, from time to time. Um, that's had one asked by Jacques. Uh, you mentioned the new reanalysis products will include chlorophyll concentration from phytoplankton functional types. Um, will one of the functional types represent dinoflagellates? Um, so the model that we use, um, HERSUM, is um, its phytoplankton functional types um, are based on size predominantly. So um, we have a pico, a nano, a micro um, phytoplankton groups, and also a diatom. Um, Group. So the diatoms are differentiating that they uh, require silicates. Um, however, the uh, microphytoplankton would probably be the best representation of a dinoflagellate group, um, although they're not explicitly um, representing dinoflagellates. So if you're looking, uh, for example, to um, looking at uh, harmful algal bloom um, forecasting, uh, you might want to be using um, Sort of a combination of products, perhaps also look at some ocean color products, maybe includes uh, data on um, seawater temperature and salinity as well. Because um, uh, in our model, we don't uh, explicitly um, include uh, features such as mixotrophy, so we're not uh, exactly representing um, some of the design of flagellates uh, you might be interested in. But if you want more details on the uh, model, uh, on Ursum that we use, I would recommend uh, a paper by Bertrand uh, 2016. There's a, a DOI reference there. So, um, if you have any uh, queries about the um, uh, details that aren't included in the quality use documents, um, uh, then yeah, that's the the reference paper I'd, I'd recommend going to. 
so next question um, from Hilda. Uh, why doesn't uh, the forecast system provide uh, plankton functional type products? Um, so this is uh, the inclusion of um, plankton functional types is a new development for the reanalysis only. Um, this was uh, um, a new development in our system and the, uh, the accuracy and uh, general performance of the um, functional type products is greatly improved by assimilating um, ocean colour product data. Um, at the time we are developing uh, the reanalysis, uh, we didn't um, have a system for um, using the, a live uh, ocean colour product that would give us the same performance in the reanalysis. So to perform the near real time uh, forecast products, we need to have a, a live um, functional type uh, ocean colour products to, uh, within, um, depending whether or not we're simulated in the day before um, or two days before um, the forecast day. Um, so we need to get that in. Uh, it's something that we could include in the future. Um, there's products that are available and the success in the reanalysis um, means we should be able to um, uh, provide this for a, a forecasting system as well. Um, however, uh, I mean, that depends as well on, on user needs. So um, the Copernicus Marine Service is uh, based on user requirements and, and user needs. So if it's something that's expressed um, widely by users that they'd find it useful, um, then that's uh, definitely something that uh, I think uh, Copernicus could, could look at providing. Um, however, if you, if you do have any um, uh, requests or suggestions about um, future developments or product improvements, um, you can contact the, the Marine um, the Copernicus Marine Service service desk to, to leave any comments. Um, there's a link on the on the website there to, to how to contact so you can email directly with the, the email addresses um, we provided. Um, so here's the questions we had uh, in advance. Um, so here's the email address again. So if you have any questions about the training, um, uh, any problems with the notebooks um, or about the products uh, um, we've been using, um, feel free to email the uh, training at, um, email address, training.cmems, or if you have any uh, further information in general or questions or suggestions about the products, um, please contact the service desk. Um, and if we have any live questions about any of the biogeochemical products that we produce, um, please feel free to, to ask them now. Uh, Second so question, there is any idea or chance to integrate social modelling into um, Mercator? Um, as far as I'm aware, not from related to the biogeochemical products, um, but maybe a wider question. I don't know if uh, someone um, from Mercator has any idea about um, that. I guess um, maybe that's a, could relate to a higher sort of trophic level model, perhaps um, fishing or um, uh, exploitation in, within the, the marine environment. Um, the model we use is just a, a lower trophic level, so we stop at uh, zooplankton, it's our uh, highest consumer, so we don't have um, uh, fisheries or impacts uh, interacting with the, with the model, but uh, I don't know if it's on the, on the scope for, for future developments. Any other questions? No question for the moment. Nope. Okay. Right. Uh, well, as I say, if you have any questions uh, that come to you at a later point, uh, please email um, the Copernicus Service Desk. Um, or uh, submit them in this chat later. Um, but if there's uh, nothing, nothing coming through, I guess moving on to our next expert, um, which will be Nieves, who will be talking to us uh, about some of the questions uh, 
for the way you've modeled products. And then Yves is an ocean wave scientist um, at the Met Office. Um, so, um, morning, Yves. How are you? Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, okay, I'll hand over to you and uh, to answer the questions. Thanks. Okay, so um, hi, everybody. I have here one question that was raised in the previous session. Um, the question was about the main difference between the Northwest self system production uh, for the wave products, obviously, and the era five systems. So uh, first of all, for those not familiar with it, ERA-5 is the latest climate reanalysis produced by ECMWF. Um, it provides hourly data on many uh, atmospheric land surface and sea state parameters, together with some estimates of uncertainty that are basically based on ensemble model data. So uh, there are two main differ differences between uh, ERA-5 and our system. Um, the, the first one is the production system itself, and the second one is the spatial resolution. So regarding the, dif the different systems, um, at the moment we are using WaveWord 3 uh, in version 4, uh, um, 18. We will move to version 6 soon. Um, and this is in a, it's a standalone version. Uh, this is forced by uh, ECMWF winds and uh, has one point, and then it's also forced by currents from CMEMS uh, Northwest Shelf from MM15. So from December, um, we will have an ocean wave couple system. So the product will not be on, uh, from the waves standalone on its own. Uh, this uh, wave couple system, it would be NEMO and WAVEWAS 3. And um, well, one thing I can say is that after some trialing, the system shows uh, minimum impact on the wave fields, uh, ensuring no degradation on the quality of the products. Um, regarding ECMWF ERA-5, um, this is an atmosphere wave couple system um, with uh, a land surface model. I think it's called something uh, like a H tessel, something like that. So they also use data simulation. Uh, they use 4D bar, as far as I'm aware, um, that is implemented in their system, that is uh, CY41 something. Uh, and this is based on the integrated forecasting system IFS, uh, which was operational from uh, 2016, I think. Uh, the wave model they use is one. Uh, with some ocean wave data simulation, as I said before. Um, so both WaveWord 3 and 1 wave models are third generation models that are very similar in structure. So regarding the resolution, uh, so the Northwest Shelf wave products uh, obviously cover only the Northwest Shelf. Um, the wave products are provided in 1.5 uh, kilometer spatial resolution. And I just included as a reminder that uh, uh, about the resolution of the wave products that although the wave model, um, the, the model products are provided on a regular 1.5 kilometer spatial resolution grid, the products are derived uh, from a model with a native grid uh, that is called SMC and it has variable resolution of three kilometers for depths larger than uh, 40 meters and 1.5 for depths um, of less than 40 meters. Uh, for ERA-5, uh, this is a global data set. Uh, wave data are produced in a latitude longitude grid uh, with a resolution of uh, 0.36 degrees, I think. Um, for what they call uh, H resolution, and one degree for the um, ensemble uh, data simulation from uh, which they get the uncertainties. Um, the atmospheric model resolution is about 30 kilometers um, and around 60 for the EDA. Uh, for the atmospheric output, uh, I believe ERA-5 has a horizontal resolution of uh, of, uh, of 30 kilometers compared to the 80 kilometers that they were using in the previous version. And that's about what I can say about uh, the main differences between these two. Um,
Okay, uh, thank you, Nevis. Um, that's a great explanation. Um, if anyone has any live questions now, um, Nevis, we can um, ask them, I think. Looks like there's one coming through now. Um, that was for me. <laughs> uh, the next question. So, uh, is there any projects on, uh, going on regarding CMIP5 and CMIP6 downscaling to the regions covered by Copernicus Marine Service, uh, particularly including wave modeling products for future projections? So, um, I don't know if like how fast this will be uh, live, let's say, for, for uh, CMEMS. We are always working on improving the resolution in the coastal areas. Um, at the moment, one of the things, like I also uh, highlighted during my presentation in the first session, is the fact that uh, you have to be aware that the coastal nodes that we are providing at, the, at this moment are normally, let's say, good enough to feed in some uh, high resolution coastal models. <clears throat> uh, because at the moment, you have to bear in mind that we, we run our model four times a day. We need to be very computational efficient. So um, we don't represent as many um, shallow water processes as, as we wish. So, um, we are always trying to improve this. We are always, we are going to improve the coastal resolution as well. Uh, also, the SMC grid allows to have a lot of flexibility in the coastal areas, which will help with this downscaling. So the answer would be, I'm not quite sure, uh, but I mean, for sure we will we will improve the coastal resolution. But I don't know in what is the time the time frame for this. Maybe Marina can highlight uh, can give us uh, some feedback for this. Um, uh, but yeah, um, like we, we obviously want to improve the coastal resolution always. So I think the, the, the milestone is to get uh, uh, at around 500 meters in the next couple of years. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, is there any, uh, any other questions? Um, about the wave products. Let's um, give people a minute or two to. In any case, if you have any doubts regarding the no the Jupyter notebooks or the wave product on its own, uh, just don't hesitate to send an email um, to the service desk, and then they they will forward to us. No one is typing. No, maybe everyone is uh, playing their Vonze Globe game. <laughs> it's yeah. Thank you very much, Nieves, for your improvement. So, if we don't have any question, I think we can close this uh, workshop. Um, so again, as a reminder, uh, you will uh, receive soon after this workshop uh, an email with all the links uh, to continue your uh, practical homework or to continue to discover the, the Copernicus Marine Service products uh, through the Jupyter notebooks, etc. And uh, so you you will receive this uh, this email and a document with all the question and answer collected during uh, these uh, two weeks of uh, uh, training workshop. Um, and if you have any question, you have the email address of the service desk uh, from CMEMS and the address of the training team of CMEMS. If you have any problem with the Jupyter uh, platform or uh, uh, some uh, tutorial videos. Again, I would like to thank
thanks uh, all the experts, the speakers and uh, the developers of the training materials, and the, the experts uh, of today, uh, Nieves, uh, Marina, Robert, Eric, Paz, uh, Sylvia, uh, Elena, uh, for their participation and their involvement in this uh, workshop. Um, thank you, Rob, for this moderation. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Chris and Vincent for uh, running this uh, really great training. And thank you, Vincent. Oh, you're uh, more welcome. So next next event, next workshop uh, on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this workshop is scheduled for the uh, 3rd uh, sure. December. So uh, we hope to see you during this workshop. You will, and, uh, they, they will receive an invitation after after this uh, this workshop. So do do not hesitate to register to the Arctic training. Yes, perfect. So have a nice day, and uh, see you soon. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye.